Okay, um, my name is Nikita Lipsky, and today, today we will talk about uh, GVM anatomy. Uh, but first, the disclaimer. Uh, originally, I made this talk in Russian. It's quite popular on YouTube. By the way, who uh, have ever seen this talk in Russian? Okay, please don't spoil. <laughs> today, I will, today I will have a puzzle, please don't spoil it. Uh, and during preparation to this lecture, I found that it's not easy to explain the same things that in English that I can easily explain in Russian. However, I will do all my best today. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself. Uh, now I work for JetBrains uh, on Compose multi-platform project. It's essentially a port of Android uh, Jetpack Compose uh, UI framework uh, to other targets like iOS, web, desktop, etc. Uh, however, majority of my professional life I spent on implementing a JVM. And that JVM was called Excelsior Jet. Excelsior Jet uh, could compile your Java programs into native executable like you do uh, with C++ programs, for instance. However, it was not just uh, Java to native code compiler like someone can, can imagine. It was a full-fledged JVM, and today I will explain why. It contained all parts of the JVM that any JVM should have. Uh, so, I know the Java since 1996, and people who are learning Java only now, hearing this, uh, sometimes ask me what Java book I would recommend them. And this simple question often puzzles me because I, I had read only two Java books. And uh, here they are. It's uh, Java Virtual Machine specification and Java Language uh, specification. Of course, I list listed uh, many Java books, read, read many, many uh, papers about Java, watched many, many Java talks, did many Java talks by myself. But there are only two, uh, uh, these two books that I read, read from cover to cover. And the left one, the Java Virtual Machine Specification, was my handbook for many years. I had to read some uh, chapters from it uh, uh, to implement our JVM. So what we are going to talk today. First, I will introduce very briefly uh, Java class file and bytecode, Java bytecode. Then we will talk about uh, the JVM itself, about uh, uh, just in time compilation and about garbage collection and etc. And uh, first, uh, let's uh, talk about Java class file. So, before you can run your Java program uh, on the JVM, you should compile your Java sources uh, into Java class file or Java bytecode using Java C compiler uh, from the GDK. Uh, and the class file looks as follows uh, from the inside. First, it has a constant pool. It is some uh, simple constants like uh, integers, uh, strings, floats, etc. But it can be some more complicated constants like uh, references to classes, fields, methods, etc. Um, then the class file has its name, um, modifiers, superclass, super interfaces, fields, methods. And any additional information is encoded via attributes in the class file. For instance, fields may have uh, attributes for their for initial constant values. And the main attribute of a method is its uh, Java, its, is its code, Java bytecode. And Java bytecode has three important things. First one is instruction array. Uh, containing the code of the bytecode, and uh, then it is operand stack. Uh, Java is stack machine uh, that has uh, intermediate results in the operand stack. Finally, it has local variables uh, uh, that uh, are method arguments and local variables of the method. And now to speak the same language, let's uh, interpret uh, the following simple bytecode uh, of four instruction. On the top right, you may see uh, local variables array, and the uh, ref, uh, right uh, bottom, we see operand stack. Uh, so, uh, instruction iLoad3 uh, 
will uh, load a third uh, local variable and push result on the stack, pushes result on the stack. The push five instruction pushes uh, five uh, constant on the stack and the instruction I add adds two and five and pushes result uh, on the stack. And I store four, will store uh, uh, the top of the stack into a local variable uh, with four number. And that's it. Okay, let's go further. Ah, and what is important uh, to understand here uh, that in the JVM specification, each instruction is very strictly defined. So two different JVMs uh, that obey JVM specification have no chances to execute the same bytecode somehow differently. Uh, so for the same input, they uh, must produce the same result. And it is cool because uh, in some languages like C, there are a lot of situations with undefined behavior that Java has not. And before we dig into GVM de details, uh, uh, let's understand uh, what does any program that runs on a GVM have? Who can answer on this question? Hmm? <laughs> Please don't be shy. <laughs> Just a little warm up. <laughs> uh, what any Java program has at, le at, at least has at, at all? Main yes, main method, uh, right, main class, main method, and uh, we should, uh, uh, classes of your application should be located some, uh, somewhere. So it also contains class path, uh, list of directories, or, or archives, uh, jar files. Uh, and since uh, Java 9, it, it may have no, uh, uh, not class path, but module path. But we won't touch uh, uh, modules today. Uh, uh, and go further. I forgot to resume. Okay. <clears throat> so. What about Java 21? 21. Uh, what about Java? Ah, main method, okay. L let me ask this question in the end. <laughs> uh, but actually it is not enough to have a JVM only to run a Java program. Uh, uh, in general, you need a Java runtime environment to do it. And Java runtime environment uh, contains JVM, it contains platform classes, it's a uh, uh, Java link object, Java link string, and, and uh, Java has a huge a standard API containing IO, NET, uh, <laughs> AW, UI, etc. And uh, uh, also some methods are declared uh, in, uh, in Java maybe declared native, so it also uh, may contain uh, native libraries for native methods implementations. And it also contains uh, auxiliary files like time zones, uh, lo uh, locale description, etc. cetera. Oh, sorry. Uh, so this is a picture that we will deal today. It uh, depicts different parts of the JVM that we will discuss one by one. And uh, we are going to start with class loading engine. Uh, 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 so first we will understand how the JVM loads classes. And, but first let's understand where JVM takes classes for class loading. And it, uh, of course, uh, it can take it from Java runtime because uh, uh, there are platform classes there. It can also, uh, your application has uh, classes of course. But uh, some classes can be generated on the fly, like dynamic proxies, proxies reflection accessors, and uh, your application may uh, uh, load classes itself, uh, uh, defining so-called uh, uh, class loader. Uh, uh, so, uh, yes, every uh, class in the JVM are, uh, is loaded by some class loader. Uh, platform classes are loaded by the bootstrap class loader. Classes from application class paths are loaded by the system class loader. And uh, application classes may create user-defined class loaders as well. 
Uh, and here we have an interesting question. What do you think? Can a JVM load two different classes with the same fully qualified name? Two different classes with the same fully qualified name. Who can answer? As far as I know, it can't. It can't? You think? Who thinks uh, other way? Right, right. Yeah. Actually, JVM can load different classes, uh, uh, the <laughs> different classes with the same fully qualified name, provided that they are loaded by different class loaders, because uh, class loaders uh, form uh, a unique class name space. Uh, with Java 9, the picture became more complex. Now a class not only has a class loader, but it also belongs to some Java module. Module forms module layers, etc., etc. If you want to uh, uh, learn more about this, you can watch two my presentations about uh, <laughs> modules. You can find them on YouTube. Um, and now let's talk how JVM, the JVM starts. Uh, first, it loads the main class, and then it looks for the main method in the main class and starts executing it. Uh, and when JVM loads a class file, it first passes uh, the class file and checks that uh, the class file is well formed. Else, it will throw a class format error. And then JVM creates a runtime a representation of the class in a special uh, uh, JVM memory area that, are, that is called Metaspace. And before any Java bytecode can be executed, uh, the class that contains Java bytecode go goes through the linking stage. It is some preparation of a class. For instance, you might know that a class may reference other classes, methods, fields, and those references are symbolic within the class file, so we need to resolve those symbolic references to real values at runtime. Uh, and another important part of the linking stage is Java bytecode verification. Uh, JVM checks certain conditions uh, to be met by Java bytecode. And Java bytecode verification is a rarely discussed topic, so when I conduct job interviews, I may ask about something about the JVM, but I usually I don't touch Java bytecode verification topic. However, once I touched it, uh, and at that time I improvised a puzzle uh, for, uh, for that candidate that I would like to ask you now. So let's now play a game, who wants to be a millionaire? <laughs> so the next question is for this uh, a nice t-shirt. <laughs> uh, let's consider the following bytecode. Uh, uh, so we have uh, a simple bytecode of four instructions, four, four instructions. First we push uh, constant two two times, then we add uh, two and two, and then we go backward. So the question is, uh, uh, what happens on execution of, the byte, of this bytecode? And A, it goes into an infinite loop. B, verify error will be thrown. C, stack overflow error will be thrown. And D, this bytecode won't be executed. So who votes for A? Okay, who votes for B? Who votes for C? And who votes for D? Okay, please explain. That's my intuition. I know it's simple. Huh? That's my intuition. Just intuition. Can you explain? Well, I have a hunch that this infinite loop, which may cause stack overflow error, gets verified before execution. Wow. What is your, uh, <laughs> it is a uh, size of your t-shirt. Yes. S. Uh, uh, so let's understand what actually happens here. Uh, so we push two constants two times, uh, uh, two constant two times. Uh, then we add two and two and go backward. So it logically it assumes that uh, uh, the program uh, will go into infinite loop. However, we may note that instruction I add takes uh, two 
uh, uh, do operands from the stack, but it pushes results uh, on the stack. Uh, so the stack grows, uh, and it's logically assumed that uh, stack overflow error will be thrown at some point. However, we may also note that the stack was empty uh, before uh, the bytecode execution, and we go backward with non-empty stack. And this situation is erroneous for, from the JVM point of view because uh, uh, by the JVM specification, the stack length should be the same for any extraction, no matter by what execution pass we came to that, uh, to that instruction. Uh, uh, so if, uh, uh, if it does not meet, does not meet uh, JVM must throw verify error. But the right answer is D. Uh, why? That is because Java bytecode verification is performed before any Java bytecode is, is executed. And it is performed for all methods of a class. So if a bytecode of a method of the class is uh, incorrect from the JVM point of view, not only this bytecode but, uh, uh, won't be executed, but any other bytecode of any other method of this class won't be executed also. And uh, any access to this class uh, will result into verify error throwing. So yes. Uh, and it is important uh, to understand that uh, Java bytecode verification is performed before any code execution. Bef because understanding that this, you should not have a wish to turn off the verifier. Because turning off the verifier does not make your Java programs faster. Uh, and to understand uh, how it is impossible to verify bytecode not, not executing it and check such complex conditions uh, uh, like about the stack length, you may watch my video, it's unfortunately in Russian, about uh, Java bytecode verification. <laughs> uh, however, so what, uh, what if we turn off the verification? I turned the verifier for exactly that bytecode from the puzzle and executed it. And we see here that it is, in this case, stack overflow error uh, was really thrown, uh, but uh, the JVM did not expect it and uh, crashed. So if you don't want uh, to get JVM crashes uh, like this, please don't disable the verifier. Uh, <coughs> And before any method of a class uh, can be executed, the class initialization should happen. It is essentially a call of static initializer of the class. We may have uh, several uh, assignments uh, in the class, static assignments, that are all comes into class, initial, uh, class initializer method. And it's, it must be called before any other method is executed for the class. And static initialization of class happens on its first use, that is a, a new instance allocation of, of, this, of type of this class, or static field access of the class, or static method call. <coughs> and now we can talk uh, how JVM executes Java bytecode. Um, and JVM may execute bytecode by two means. It can interpret it or compile into native code that will run directly on underlying hardware. This is the simplest interpreter uh, may look as follows. We can start, uh, we start execution from the first instruction and we do the following in the loop. First we fetch next instruction from instruction array, fetch operands of the instruction from the stack, execute the instruction, and then if the instruction is a branch, we go to the target instruction, or we just go to the next instruction. And it goes until we meet uh, throw or return instructions. Uh, and such kind interpreters exist, for instance, in hotspot GVM and called uh, zero interpreter. However, such kind of interpreters are very slow. So modern GVMs used uh, Another approach, it's so-called uh, template interpreters. And template, template interpreter uh, first compiles all Java bytecode instructions uh, to a sequence of target CPU instructions or templates. And then it interprets uh, a bytecode by just jumping to a corresponding template. 
you may watch uh, the video of Volker Simonis regarding this. Template interpreters uh, are significantly faster than the simplest one, but uh, they still execute Java bytecode slowly. So uh, to make your Java programs really fast, we need to translate bytecode into native code using compilers and run that native code directly on CPU. But compilers can be different. Uh, they can ju be just uh, be, uh, they can be very simple and generate some native code for each bytecode instruction, producing some native code in the end. Uh, it is faster than template interpreter, but because branch predictors start working, but it is still slow, unfortunately. So, uh, <laughs> so um, compilers can be also be more complicated, more sophisticated. So before translating into native code, they translate Java bytecode into some internal representation. Uh, then they perform optimizing transformation with, uh, transformations with this internal uh, representation. For instance, they can do uh, methods in lining from one to another. And such compilers uh, are called optimizing compilers. But among optimizing compilers, there are also uh, simple ones that do simple optimization, but very quickly. And there are complex ones that do complex optimization, but res and resulting uh, in mu much more optimal code. But they do it slowly. Uh, so that is, uh, in the field of compilers, we have uh, uh, some trade-off. Either we compile fast and get not very optimal code, or we compile slowly, but the resulting code works fast. You may, may watch uh, the following video about C2 compiler in Hotspot. It's a complex compiler by our author, author of C2 compiler, Cliff Cliff. Uh, we can also differentiate compilers by time uh, when they work. So we may compile uh, Java bytecode uh, dynamically. So a translation uh, into native code happens at application runtime, or we can compile them statically, so before program execution. Le uh, and yes, dynamic compilers work concurrently with your program, and dynamic compilers compile only hot code, uh, that is a code that is frequently executed. Hotness of the code is determined by, the prof by profilers uh, uh, that may also collect uh, some uh, other important information uh, about your program that can be then used by, for program optimizations. But one way or another, dynamic uh, compilers work concurrently with your program, which in general affects its execution. Uh, so the question is why not compile bytecode before program execution, not wasting resources at runtime? <laughs> Dynamic compilers compile hot code only, but what if a program does not have a, so, a clearly defined hot code? It happens, so, for instance, on startup where JVM has to interpret its, uh, the bytecode before it becomes hot. That results in slow uh, startup. And uh, this is where static compilers come into play. Uh, they can optimize every method in your program using the most aggressive optimization, resulting in better startup, at least, and even better performance uh, for certain types of applications. By the way, uh, you can note that if a Java program is compiled statically, it may happen that no bytecode will be executed at runtime. And the question arises here, uh, where is the JVM? But this question arises only when uh, the JVM is percepted uh, as a something that uh, uh, actually executes Java bytecode. But this assumption is not correct. In fact, uh, Java bytecode is executed only when it is interpreted. And all modern JVMs uh, do their best to stop executing bytecode as fast as possible by translating bytecode into native code that runs directly on CPU. And in this, in this sense, uh, when we get that native code before or during execution doesn't really matter. After all, all JVM consists, uh, not only the execution engine, is, they have a lot more garbage collection, reflection, and all the rest should work in any JVM implementation. Uh, if you would like to learn more about uh, JIT versus AIT, you also may watch my presentation. Uh, now let's talk about um, meta-information subsystem that implements two important things uh, within the JVM. It's reflection and JNI. 
reflection is key feature of Java that allows access to classes, fields, methods just by their name, by string literals from a Java program. And reflection is widely used in modern uh, Java frameworks, and uh, they, uh, it, 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 it is also used for dynamic programming languages implementations, uh, such as Python or Ruby, that were not even supposed to run on the GVM. But with the help of reflection, they can actually run on the GVM. Uh, <laughs> moreover, to allow dynamic languages to be executed e efficiently on the GVM, a new instruction called Invoke dynamic uh, was added uh, to the JVM instruction set. Unlike other invoke instructions where target method lookup procedure is strictly defined by the specification, you may specify the lookup procedure for invoke dynamic programmatically. Target ob object for invoke dynamic is not a method, uh, but a so-called method handle, which can be a method or it can be access to a field or combination of other method handles. And uh, uh, the Java platform has a rich API for building method handles, and the uh, method handles themselves can be used outside of invoke dynamics, so they often uh, called as reflection to zero. Uh, <coughs> and you may declare some methods in Java as native, and then it is supposed that you write actual implementation of the method in C language. As you may need to call Java methods in that simple uh, uh, implementation of a method, native method, you can do it using Java native interface. Uh, so GNI, Java native interface, binds the GVM with the outside world. Uh, GDK uh, itself uh, has a lot of native methods for implementing I.O., networking, etc. And GNI, GNI as, and as a reflection, is implemented in the GVM as an access to Metaspace. So uh, we have all runtime representation of all classes in the Metaspace, and we can easily implement uh, as a G, a reflection as GNI. And what is important to note here is that JNI does not depend on implementation details of a particular JVM. So once you write a native method using JNI, you can reuse this implementation for any other JVM. However, Java programmers do not like writing in C, but sometimes they need to employ platform-specific APIs. And to solve this problem, project on Panama appeared in Java that allows to call C functions from Java directly without going to C and JNI. Here are two links about Project Panama. Now let's talk about multi-threading. Multi-threading is a key feature of the Java platform. Uh, its support allows Java programs to use the full power of modern hardware. And for example, some dynamic languages uh, don't support multi-threading. Uh, and all modern operating systems have support for multi-threading, and Java reuses OS capabilities to implement its multi-threading support. And in particular, uh, uh, Java and Thread um, uh, is mapped uh, to one operating system thread and in one-to-one -one ratio. Each thread has a reserved region of memory that is called uh, thread stack, containing local variables and operand stack of methods. Methods are, uh, uh, we can call them methods frames, being executed within a thread. And the size of the stack, uh, thread stack is a JVM parameter. It is important to understand here that when a method is called from another method, the called method is executed on the same thread, while the memory for its locals and operand stack is allocated by the GVM on the thread stack. And thus, uh, the called methods from, form a call stack. And the GVM has all the information about this stack. So it can decode uh, the stack trace at any time, uh, nevertheless, the stack may contain natively compiled message frames. However, it appears that one-to-one -one mapping of Java threads to native thread scheme is, not, is too expensive because there are limitations on how many native threads can be created. So since uh, Java 
<laughs> 21. <laughs> Java offers a called virtual threads that are managed by JVM itself. Uh, uh, before Loom that implements virtual threads, only thousands of uh, threads could be created. With Loom, hundreds of thousands of virtual threads can be created. And knowing a call stack helps the JVM to implement exception handling. In Java, uh, there is no overheads for entering to a try block, and when uh, an exception is thrown uh, from one method, JVM can easily find its handler in another method and uh, transfer a control to it. But writing multi-threaded code is not easy task. Let's consider the following example. In thread one, we first fetch some uh, data, and then uh, 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 we notify another thread that data is ready by setting ready flag to true. Uh, thread two waits uh, while uh, data is ready, and, uh, the, and somehow processes the data. By the way, who thinks uh, that it is okay to write uh, multi-threaded code like here? No one who don't think so. <laughs> okay, uh, what's the problem here? Mm. First, as I said, JVM may have optimizing compilers that may compile uh, both method of threads into native code, and optimizing compilers uh, tries to produce the most effective code as possible. And they may reorder for optimizations rights within a method uh, for this purpose. Uh, moreover, modern uh, CPUs also try to execute uh, your programs as fast as possible, and they also can reorder uh, rights. So if they do it, uh, it may happen that uh, the flag already becomes true before the data is actually uh, obtained, resulting in incorrect execution of the thread two. How to fix this? In this particular sample, you may declare ready flag as volatile. And if you do it, uh, uh, the JVM won't reorder writes in this example, and moreover, it, it will insert memory barriers that will prevent CPU to do it as well. There is a separate chapter in Java language specification called Java Memory Model that defines how threads interact through a shared memory. It is a very complex uh, <laughs> chapter in the Java language specification uh, for understanding, and uh, I recommend to watch Alexei Shipilov's uh, talk regarding it. Um, for safe access to shared memory, synchronized methods and synchronized blocks are used. So when one thread enters a synchronized block, it acquires so-called monitor, or lock associated with any object in Java, and other threads uh, that enter the synchronized block for the same object must wait until the first one releases the lock. The question how it is implemented in the JVM. Naive implementation may, may use uh, operating system synchronization primitives uh, like mutex, critics, uh, critical sections, but if the JVM always used system logs for synchronizations, uh, programs on the JVM would be very, very slow because synchronization occurs very often in Java programs. And acquiring a system log is a very expensive uh, operation. Fortunately, JVM optimizes the case when there is no contention for an object, uh, and it does it almost without performance overheads. On the other hand, uh, using built-in synchronization today is not safe state of the art for uh, writing multi-threaded code. Instead, Java util concurrent primitives are recommended to use today. And uh, we are near to end, so let's talk about memory management in Java. And, and uh, Java program, pro pro programmers have very simple interface to memory allocation. It is just a new operator that is supposed to locate object in so-called Java heap. Uh, and that's all. Uh, so when the objects will be freed, 
programmers do not control. Uh, and Java and JVM specification says almost nothing about uh, uh, how JVM allocates memory, how it uh, collects uh, garbage. Uh, it all only says that, uh, yes, JVM may, have uh, may automatically free allocated memory. But how it will do it, it, it is not somehow specified. Uh, however, um, Usual Java programs allocate a lot of objects. So it turned into requirement that allocation must be fast in Java. So as a rule, the JVM queries OS for, uh, for memory not for uh, one object, but for many objects at once, which gives it ability to allocate an object by moving the boundary in a pre-allocated large piece of memory. It's a called uh, bump the pointer technique. It's just a few instructions. In addition, since uh, the heap is shared by threads, uh, so any allocation of an object is a modification of the heap. We, and, uh, we must first allocate uh, object thread safely, but uh, it would be too expensive to acquire a global lock for allocation. The, therefore, uh, uh, each thread has its own personal region of memory for allocation that is called thread local heap. So actually allocation in Java is fast. Um, how objects look in the memory is not specified by the uh, uh, JVM specification as well. However, um, except memory for its instance fields, some hidden, hidden data should be allocated uh, with any object that is and this hidden data is called uh, Java object header. Uh, for instance, any Java object has a reference to its class, so this reference is, uh, should be stored somewhere, it's stored in the header. And we may synchronize on any Java object, uh, so some data for synchronization should be in the header. So uh, for identity hash code and uh, JVM requires flags for garbage collector. <coughs> As to instance fields, if you think that that will reside in the memory in the same order uh, as you declare, the, declare them in the source code, it's not true. Because the JVM may reorder instance fields as it, as it wants uh, in sake of size optimizations, alignment, or target uh, architecture specifics. You may watch this video of Alexei Shipilov regarding this subject. However, we may note that even uh, that, that objects that uh, even do, do not have any fields uh, will take some memory uh, due to object header. And it is a problem that Java tries to solve. First, it tries to solve it by optimizing that header. And probably you heard about project Valhalla uh, that tries to introduce a concept of objects that do not require a header at all. But uh, the work is in progress. Uh, <laughs> the project uh, is for 10 years, I believe, uh, when it uh, will be released. I don't know. OK. And now, finally, let's talk about the most popular topic about Java, garbage collection. Uh, when I conduct job interviews and ask about garbage collection in, in Java, candidates often start me explaining this picture. Um, but first, this picture is a bit outdated, and second, let's first understand uh, what is garbage, what we are going to collect. Who can explain me what is garbage? Some sort of object without references. Okay. Uh, well, well, now we have references from from this object to this object. Is this object garbage or not? Yes. Because why? Uh, well, I would say that it is uh, the, the objects in which we don't have an access in our current execution flow. And that they can be like uh, <coughs> point to each other, but we are unable to access them right now. OK. And, uh, from the old stack of invocation, we can't all access it. 
Okay. Uh, but usually, yes, yes. When I ask what is garbage uh, to candidates, uh, <laughs> they often start make, uh, explaining it uh, in terms of references. And when I show them cycle, uh, they often puzzle because it's not uh, actually easy to define the garbage uh, just uh, using the term reference. Uh, but uh, let's define it somehow differently. What if we define that garbage are objects uh, that cannot be used by a program? <laughs> As you said, generally, right? Uh, but it then uh, leads us to a question of what objects can be used by a program. And the answer is, of course, not garbage, right? <laughs> <laughs> so let us define, actually, what is not garbage. Let us think about it. Of course, objects that are in static fields of classes can be used by a program, so they are definitely not garbage. Objects that are in local variables um, uh, also can be used by a program, so uh, they are not garbage as well. Is it all or not? Closures? Yeah, yes, uh, so, uh, uh, references again, again, yes, closures of all uh, objects that we have in local variables and in static fields, and we closure it. But do we have something more that is not garbage? Something from the network. Okay, yeah, it's it's good catch. <laughs> but <laughs> first, let let us understand. Uh, for instance, uh, for, for for instance, we have uh, such a simple assignment. We assign uh, a new object uh, to some uh, local variable. But it happened that uh, GC was happened uh, uh, just after object uh, was allocated, but before it was assigned to a local variable. And the question is, if this newly allocated object is garbage or not? <laughs> yes, great. <laughs> Yeah, yes, because yes, now we can recall that methods have uh, not only local variables, uh, uh, um, they also have operand stack and all temporal, uh, uh, and when uh, object is allocated, it's first pu pushed on, on the stack. So yes, uh, now we have a little bit more uh, defined uh, our uh, what is not garbage. So we have objects in static fields, objects that are accessible from a method frame, which is a local variable and operand stack. But the question is, uh, what method we are talking about? Main. Only main? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, we, uh, now we can uh, recall that uh, Java uh, is executed in many threads. Any thread has a uh, uh, method call, uh, 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 call stack, call stack. So, uh, so all methods from all threads, uh, 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 local variables and operand stacks from all methods and from uh, of all threads can be used by our program, of course. Uh, so, yes, uh, and uh, we, now we can define what is not garbage. It is object in static fields of classes, objects uh, that are accessible from method friends, uh, local API, that is local variables and parents stand for of all threads. And we do closure, objects that are referenced by not garbage is not garbage as well. Uh, so we are cl closer to the definition. Um, with, actually, we may define so-called uh, GC root sets. Uh, of objects that are by definition objects in static fields, objects that are accessible from thread stacks. And you said, already mentioned that, uh, we, should, uh, we should recall that we have native methods that are written in C using GNI, and they may reference Java objects from C code via GNI references. So GNI references are also in GC roots. And uh, so finally, we can define not garbage or live objects as objects from GC roots objects uh, and that are uh, 
uh, and objects that are referenced from live object, objects. Everything else is garbage. Uh, this definition leads us to the simplest garbage collection algorithm. Algorithm. First one is called mark and sweep, where we start from the root set uh, and mark all live objects going by reference, doing closure. Uh, finally, we can sweep uh, not marked objects. Uh, uh, second one called stop and copy, when we divide heap by two semispaces and starting from the root set again, copy live objects from one space to another. In the end, uh, first space won't contain live objects and can be reused uh, for copying into the next collection cycle. <coughs> but as you may note, garbage is defined only for a certain moment of a program execution. As soon as program is, is executed a little bit more, some objects can die, some can be newly located, and therefore, to determine where is garbage, in general, the GVM must pause uh, all threads and determine where, the where is the garbage. And this pause is called uh, stop the world pause. Stop the world pause can be noticeable to an external observer, and th uh, this can be very unpleasant, uh, and sometimes it can be simply unacceptable. Java is often criticized because of their GC poses. Uh, so one uh, of the main tasks of modern garbage collectors is to reduce the stop the world pose. And uh, the, uh, it can be done by using the following three techniques. First uh, one is called incremental, when we collect not all the garbage within GC pose. Second one is parallel, when we collect the garbage in parallel threads within GC pose, and finally we can con uh, collect the garbage concurrently with program execution. For instance, in mark and sweep algorithm, we could uh, uh, mark all objects uh, in GC pose, but sweep all, the, all them, uh, them all uh, concurrently with program execution, uh, unposing all threads. <coughs> Important, uh, important class of garbage collectors for Java is called generational garbage collect uh, collectors. And they are based on the following hypothesis, uh, that most objects uh, die young, and all objects rarely references, uh, reference young objects. This uh, hypothesis allows to perform so-called minor collection cycles when only garbage in young generation is collected. It allows to greatly reduce top the world poses. Uh, however, when all generation becomes full, we anyway need to perform full collection cycle, and uh, thus uh, <laughs> generational garbage collectors uh, just only postpone the problem uh, of long GC poses. So modern garbage collector collectors for Java tend to collect garbage fully concurrently. Uh, there are uh, the implementations of fully concurrent garbage collectors uh, in Java, like ZGC or Shenando. Uh, yes. And finally, I'd like to say that garbage collection is still actively researched area in scientific world. Uh, and uh, one perspective idea, in my honest opinion, is based on another hypothesis, and it's called thread local hypothesis, that says that most objects die in a thread that creates them. And for this case, uh, <coughs> uh, we can collect thread local garbage within a respective thread, not uh, posing other threads. So we'll be, there will be no GC pose for, for this hypothesis. Um, but I don't know any production-ready implementation of this idea, but it looks very promising. Finally, yes, uh, about garbage collection, I can recommend a book. It's called uh, The Garbage Collection Handbook. Uh, you may find it by this link. And uh, we are near to end. Finally, let's talk up, uh, about monitoring. Uh, so. As you could note, JVM knows 
everything about your Java programs, about uh, all loaded classes, about all live objects, about all threads, about, about all methods that are executed within the threads. And the question is why <laughs> not share this runtime information with you? And uh, actually it shares uh, this information by means of two JVM interfaces. First one is called JVM tool interface that is used by debuggers, profilers. You can connect to running Java program with debugger or profile and uh, take all the information about program execution. And there is also another uh, interface called Java Management Beans uh, that uh, can tell you everything else about the program, about its heap space, etc., etc. And it's used by real-time monitoring tools like JConsole, Visual VM, etc. Uh, so that's all that I wanted to tell you about the JVM. And now let's take a general uh, look at our picture. So the input of the, G of the JVM is uh, uh, Java bytecode and native methods. Um, implementation of native methods. The bytecode can be either pre-compiled into native code and some metadata. Native code will be directly executed on uh, underlying hardware, but metadata will go to uh, uh, JVM. <laughs> uh, then uh, classes that were not pre-compiled will be bytecode from classes, Java bytecode from classes that were not uh, pre-compiled will be executed uh, either by interpreter or by just-in-time compiler. During execution, uh, uh, new objects are allocated and uh, they are automatically collected by garbage collector. Uh, Java works in multiple threads and has uh, all the information about your programs that it can share. Uh, so, it was an abstract JVM scheme. Now let's talk about concrete implementations of, of the JVM. Uh, reference implementation of the, G, of the JVM is called Hotspot. Originally it was developed by Sun Microsystems, then Sun Microsystems was acquired by Oracle. Now Hotspot is part of OpenJDK and has many contributors from various big companies and individuals, but the main contributor is still Oracle. Uh, before Java became open source, there was a real competition between uh, a completely different JVM implementation. First one is IBM J9. It, uh, it, uh, it is now also open sourced. And before Oracle acquired Sun Microsystem, it had another JVM implementation called JRocket. Excelsior Jet was another uh, JVM implementation completely written from scratch. Uh, there is also Azul Zinc uh, JVM implementation. It is based on hotspot sources, but has its own implementation of garbage collector and just-in-time compiler. Too big is part of the JVM, so it's almost independent as well. And there is also Grail VM project. project. Uh, it's JVM also based on hotspot, but it has uh, own just-in-time compiler. Uh, and it's interesting to note here that it is fully implemented in Java. So yes, compilers can be implemented in Java and no problem with it. Uh, and there are a lot of builds of OpenGDK by different components that may have some patches or tunings inside. For instance, we at JetBrains also built OpenGDK that is called JetBrains Runtime that has a lot of patches for Swing and the AWT for JetBrains IDE, IDEs to look nicer than on a regular open GDK build. So that's all for today. Now let's make some conclusion. conclusion. As you may know, the GVM is quite sophisticated but very interesting thing. In my honest opinion, Java is still golden mean of modern IT technolo technologies. First, it's uh, strictly specified in every detail. And it allows to execute, and it was designed to, to, to execute Java programs very efficiently, almost by the speed of low-level languages uh, like C or C++. 
On the other hand, it has dynamic features that can be found only in dynamic runtimes that, make has, that makes Java very powerful technology. And finally, all GVM implementations are constantly evolving at the cutting edge of science and technology. So, uh, such areas like garbage collection and compilers are just scientific subjects uh, that are still act uh, actively researched. And as Java is open source, you may also do your, your scientific research, researches using a real code base. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>